Our text today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 4, verse 1. It reads, this is the English Standard Version, it says, And seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. The Living Bible Translation says, At that time, so few men will be left alive that seven women will fight over each of them and say, let us all marry you. We will furnish our own food and clothing. Only let us be called by your name so that we won't be mocked as old maids. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to focus on the main thing, which is the plain thing. And the main thing is not the women, but it's the one that they chose to attempt to put their trust in. Help us to learn through your word today to put our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm working on a series, and I was working on it uh, before uh, the COVID-19 virus uh, invaded our midst. Uh, it's from the first six uh, chapters of the book of Isaiah, and it, the series is titled, Show Me Me. We're getting back to that series starting this morning. And this morning's uh, subject under the heading of Show Me Me is trust Jesus and not man in that day. Now, uh, I've had some response about the purple shirt. And I want to assure everyone that there is a madness behind the purple shirt. Just as with Nike, you don't have to hear anything about Nike and their tennis shoes or whatever. All you have to do is see that swish. That's their brand. With McDonald, all you have to do is see that golden arc. That's their brand. And even with Kellogg's, see that big K? Kellogg's, that's their brand. Well, the purple shirt along with our logo, I don't know if you can see it or not, that's the Mount Sinai brand. That's necessary because there are uh, uh, 16 Mount Sinai churches in the city of Memphis. And then when you start moving out there, all kind, everybody chose, I don't know why, but some, some, at some point in time, Mount Sinai was a popular name for a church. So we're, we're trying to brand ourselves and differentiate us from other Mount Sinai. Not to say that we are any better. We just want to uh, not be confused with others. We want, just like every believer ought to be identified by the way we love one another and we love the Lord. Because Jesus says, if you love one another, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. So our loving each other is our brand as Christians. Now, we always see ourselves in a better light than others, especially God. In our text, at a time is important. As we go, we, we there are many at a times at that time that comes along in our lives. Yeah, I remember my orthopedic surgeon when I was having uh, issues with my hip, and I needed a hip replacement. I I, I, did, I wasn't the type of person to go running in. All right, let's get the old one out and the new one in. And and he understood that. He said, "You'll let me know when that time comes." And God has a way of letting us know when that time comes. And something special had happened then, and it happens over a period of time. And perhaps we are, at that time has come again in our lives with the COVID-19 uh, virus. Perhaps there's something that God has got fed up with us about or something that he's trying to get our attention and say you, 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 you're getting to the point where you're trusting too much in men and not enough in me. 
Now, the situation was so few men were left alive that seven women were fighting over each one of them. And they would say, let's all marry. Let us all marry you. We will furnish our own food and clothing. Only let us be called by your name so that we won't be mocked as old maids. There's a lot being said in this verse, a lot that, 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 that women have said in their hearts, this I will never do. I haven't found a, 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 a woman yet, and I've only checked with one, and I've been married uh, to her for 46 years now. And she has never once said, Henry, I'm willing to share you with other women. But these women were in an unusual situation. Things had gotten so bad that they were willing to share a man. Uh, 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 I do some pre-marriage counseling and I do some marriage counseling. Especially in the pre-marriage counseling, women always want an answer to the question, what are you willing to, what are you going to bring to the table? In other words, do you have a job? Do you have a car? Do you have a house? Do you have any money in the bank? Do you have other children because I don't want no baby mama drama? What are you going to bring to the table? But these women said, we will furnish our own food and clothing. You don't have to bring anything to the table. All we want is your name. Now, in life, we try to always see ourselves in a better light than other people. And we even think that we can hide some of the rough spots, some of the wrinkles in our lives from God even. Oprah Winfrey has special cameras that makes her look good to her audience. The, the me that I present to people when I'm out publicly or on Facebook or other social medias, is always better than the one that you would see if you showed up at my front door unannounced. I've noticed that there are smartphones that even have apps on them that make us look like we're posing for glamour shots. But God sees us up close without the makeup, without what we hide from one another. He sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. God sees the person that husbands and wives never see in a lifetime. God sees the preacher, the deacon, the trustee, the mother, the usher, the choir members, the musicians. When we have no thought of ourselves being exposed to the omniscient God that created us and sustains us. We have relatives that can't stand us because of what they know about us. We have friends that unfriended us on Facebook and in life because of what somebody else said about us. But God, on the other hand, knows everything about us and still loves us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then, after God gave his son, Romans 5 and 8 says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The son God wanted for himself, he gave for us to live. John 10 and 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly in that day. Does not refer to a day in time, but rather a time in days. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, God isn't late 
as with his promise as some measure lateness. He's restraining himself on account of us, holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. But when the days of God's judgment does come, it will come unannounced like a thief in the night. The sky will collapse with a thunder and a bang and everything will disintegrate in a huge inferno. Earth and all its works exposed to the scrutiny of God's judgment. And since everything here today might well be gone tomorrow, do you see how essential it is for us to live a holy life, daily expecting the day of God and eager for its arrival. In that day, when right will seem like wrong and wrong will seem like right, that's the day that these women are confronted with in life. They have changed what was normal. They have changed the, the standards that God had set. They have changed God's way of, of for them to live life. And they are going about to establish their own righteousness. Second Timothy three and one says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulties. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. They will be treacherous, reckless, sullen, or swollen rather, with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Our text, as far back as chapter 2, verse 6, through our text, chapter 4, verse 1, speaks of a moral degradation over a period of time where life's moral changes have brought about a depraved society. With these seven women, it is to be presumed that these women have lost their husbands and sons and are therefore left socially defenseless, even though they are not without means. This was a common aftermath of war. It was contractually and legally the husband's responsibility to provide food and clothing for their wives. These women are not looking for financial provisions. Their need for matrimonial association may simply stem from social mandates or, in the worst case, may reflect the desire for a household for children that have been conceived through rape by enemy soldiers. The first verse is really a part of the third chapter, when the trouble should come upon the land and the unmarried state was deemed reproachable among the Jews. These women would act contrary to the common usage and seek husbands for themselves. War has always resulted in the destruction of the male population. For example, Approximately one million Frenchmen, one million German, and a half million English males soldiers died in World War II. So many men would die in Israel that women would be desperate for male companionship and support. The text does not indicate that the women, and this is true for men also, need more than physical support. There is a need for encouragement, encouragement, companionship, and as God put it in Genesis uh, chapter 2, 
someone to be with him. But he looked at Adam and said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helpmate, to somebody to be with him. These women would be willing to humiliate themselves to escape the, re the reproach of being a unmarried and childish. Long gone is the hope of gaining a man through seductions of the eyes. Now in that day, even begging and pleading was and will be ineffective. Women providing their own food and clothing is the reverse order of God's intention in marriage. In Exodus 21 and 10, it says, if he takes another wife, he's married, but if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish the food or clothing uh, or her marital rights. Speaking of the one that he already had before he decided to take another one because those were things that he was obligated to provide. Likewise, women taking men's places and leading them as Eve did with Adam in Genesis chapter three illustrates a desperate situation. So we must ask ourselves the question, what am I doing that identifies me as acting out of a desperate situation? Young ladies, if I can speak to you, just for a moment, more and more young girls are acting out of desperate situations they are uh, 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 looking for because they, they think they can't find a good man. And, and usually we, we don't find what we need because we don't take time to prepare for it and to look for it. And when you prepare for it, you don't have to look for it. God will bring it to you. But we got far too many young girls that are hooking up with older men that are most of the time already married. We will become dependent in the most degrading and disadvantageous ways when we're not willing to wait and trust on the, in the Lord. What we are trying to avoid is what we always end up with. We must realize that in departing from Jesus and running to others for our needs, that we are bound to run into Jesus because he's at our point of departure and our place of arrival at the same time. Somebody said he's so large, you can't go over him. He's so wide, you can't go around him. And he's so deep that you can't go under him. All of this searching for a new norm that's happening in that day and in this day, namely when God judges his people for trusting in other human beings and themselves rather than in him. Many of the judgments prophesied in this section of Isaiah took place during the Babylonian captivity and during the Assyrian captivity of the Northern Kingdom. But that day also anticipates tribulation uh, uh, times and perilous times. Let me just say a little bit about tribulation. Tribulation is an external circumstance that causes an individual a great deal of internal stress. Does that sound like what the coronavirus is doing in our lives? It's an external circumstance that's causing an individual a great deal of internal stress. And, and tribulation knows no respect of person. The Hebrew word, sar, S-A-R, or sara, S-A-R-A. And the Greek word, I'm not going to try to spell it, ellipsis, derives from roots that graphically portrays the process in which a person is first limited. 
we are limited on what we can do. Everybody is, is looking for somebody else to help them. So much so that we overlook the simple things that we can do. I've got a note here on my desk. It says, do your part by staying apart to save lives. And I just throw in there, the life that you save might be your own. Even when we're feeling limited on what we can do. And then we, 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 we feel walled in. Like, like, like every which way we try to go. Every turn we make, the walls are closing in on us. And, and, and I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes sitting around here, the time that we've been here, it, sometimes it feels like the walls are closing in on me. But then I can just mention the name of Jesus. And the space starts to expand. And then, not only limited and walled in, but gradually squeezed until something must give. That might sound like a bad situation to be in, but actually it's a good situation because people, especially African Americans, are good and at our best when we're at what I call have to situation. When we have to do something, we are at our best. We are at our strongest when we are at have to situations. But the danger is, without Jesus directing or ordering our steps in his word, we will end up in tight spots where our resources and our peace and our joy and a host of other things that we've grown used to will be limited. Without Jesus, we tend to be walled in with no place to turn. When we're walled in, the only choice left is to wallow in the situation that we find ourselves. In that day, when we trust Jesus, in, when we trust man instead of Jesus, in that day, nobody will notice their expensive clothes, their jewelry, their perfume, and their elaborate hairstyle. I was thinking about it the other day. It used to be I would go to the cleaners, take clothes to the cleaners once a week, shirts and pants. I have not been to the cleaners, not once, since this virus epidemic has take, been about. I haven't been wearing, this is as dressed up as I've been getting, my Mount Sinai purple shirt with the logo on it. So I, I haven't been worried about what I've been wearing. I'm at home, I'm comfortable. These women would be prisoners of war led by a rope like cattle going to the slaughter. So many men would be killed that there wouldn't be enough husbands to go around. God is long suffering as he watches people viciously exploit one another and selfishly ravage his creation. But there is coming a day when unbelieving sinners will be punished and God's people will share in the glory of his kingdom. My question is, are you ready for that? Are you ready for it? The question comes, what can I do to be ready? I pose another question to answer that question. What can wash my sins away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the answer. Not in what we can do, not in what man we can find to do something for us, but what Jesus does for us. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For by grace are we saved, not of works, but we're saved by grace through faith. 
not of works, lest any man should boast. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct or make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil, and it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Psalms 37 and 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Here's what you need to do. Trust in the Lord and do good, and so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Well, I've got to end it now. But before I go, I need to mention that, that, that there's one particular line in a song that I want to meditate on in this post. I ask that you would indulge me as I attempt to endeavor in a bit of hymn exegesis. Hymns are not scripture, but the best ones arrive from biblical meditations and are choked full of rich gospel truth. Hymns help us to remember truth and to turn that truth into worship of the triune God. There's a line in a song that goes something like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground, my brothers and my sisters, is sinking sand. Part two of this sermon, trust Jesus in that day. Comes next week, the Lord will. I pray that God will give the increase and the Holy Spirit will massage your mind and give you understanding of what I have feebly attempted to share with you today. Heavenly Father, bless us as we go forward to trust you and not man and not ourselves but help us to lean and trust in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is in his powerful name we pray. Amen. Until next time.